This is uh, My Usability Goes to 11, a hacker's guide to user experience research. So to just give a little background, uh, I started out as a script kitty, DEF CON 17, just running around, popping shit. Uh, went to grad school and became a UX researcher, did a couple internships at Mozilla and Palo Alto Research Center, and my master's thesis focused on how to redesign the Tor browser bundle so that it would be a little more usable for non-experts. Uh, basically, my focus was these things called privacy enhancing technologies, and we'll get a little bit into the whole you know privacy versus security terminology later on. And currently, I am a staff technologist at the Center for Democracy and Technology in Washington, D.C. That basically means that I do hill visits occasionally doing some, some uh, lobbying, but mostly I work on web standards and uh, serving as an in-house expert for our advocacy. So to just give a high-level outline, we're going to talk about why usability is important, why is usability hard? Why is usable security especially hard? And how we can evaluate our tools to see whether or not they're usable. And these all sound like relatively simple things, but they get, ha get hard very quickly. So to just sort of set us up terminology wise, when we talk about security, we're usually basically talking about the CIA triad. We're talking about confidentiality. We're talking about integrity. Is this data being modified in transit? And we're talking about Availability, non-repudiation, things like that. Privacy is just control over your personal information in general. If you don't have security, you're never going to get to privacy because someone else already has that control for you. And so these privacy-enhancing technologies are just any technology that lets you control your privacy. So something like Veracrypt that lets you en encrypt your files, that could be a privacy-enhancing technology. Something like Tor is usually considered a privacy-enhancing technology. So. At the high level, why even encourage pet adoption? Why shouldn't these people just RTFM? Why does making privacy usable matter? Well, we've extensively documented the existence of mass surveillance. And studies have shown that mass surveillance chills free speech. It chills what we talk about. It chills what we look at. This chilling effect has an effect on our democracy. If we want to have a republic, we have to have debate. Period. End of story. Why encourage adoption of these technologies? The math is good. If you look at the uh, current surveillance practices, the uh, so-called Five Eyes are mostly focusing on bulk collection and injection. Uh, we have, uh, oh, great, I don't have the notes, but, we, but, these, uh, but these NSA systems like Tempura, for example, where we're, uh, well, that was GCHQ, but when you're sucking up massive amounts of data, if that data is encrypted, it's not as useful. Uh, if that, uh, the transmission of that data is using HTTPS or some sort of integrity check. It's much harder to modify in transit, much harder to shoot malware in there. Um, we don't have any evidence that the more common encryption standards like AES or PGP have been subverted. There was, you know, the NIST interestingness. Um, so basically, we know that our underlying technologies are solid. Uh, we need to resist this urge to fall into what uh, Mika Lee called security nihilism and focus on making sure that the tools that we have are used by as many people as possible. And thirdly, we have the idea of network effects. You know, w most of you may have heard of Metcalfe's law, the idea that the strength of a network is n to the power of two, n being the number of users. This is especially true for anonymity systems. Um, you know, again, uh, in the community, sometimes we'll use the phrase RTFM when we're talking about something like, you know, Linux, but when we're talking about a privacy tool, a privacy tool is best when the most people can use it. So for example, with Tor, the bigger that swarm is, the less chance I have of knowing who you in particular are. Um, on the other hand, as one of my friends from Pittsburgh said, nobody wants to download a special application to talk to Greg Norsey when I asked them to download Signal. <laughs> Luckily, uh, certain, uh, with certain recent events in the news, people have been more and more willing to uh, use encryption. So why encourage adoption of these technologies? Because nothing to hide is a load. Everybody wants privacy. If you don't think that you want privacy in your life, see me after this talk so I can set up a Nest Cam in your bathroom. <laughs> so we, we, we all want some privacy. We, we've set a floor. What we're talking about is the ceiling. So that brings us to our next point. If usability is so important, why don't we just add usability to these products? And that when I was making these slides, reminded me of this Neil deGrasse quote, Obama authorized North Korean sanctions over cyber hacking, 
Solution there, it seems to me, is to create unhackable systems. <laughs> Just like I think we in this community know by now that you can't simply bolt on security after you've designed a product. Similarly, you can't just come in at the end, throw your tool at a, de at a designer and say, hey, can you make this usable? It's not going to work. And usability is hard. We can define when a system is secure. If you can, if you can, if I send out a packet, we can, we can do these entropy calculations. We can see how long it would take to decrypt this given the key space, yada, yada. There's no real way to know is this piece of software usable. It's just a continual and iterative process. And even when we ask users for feedback, it might not be helpful. I'm sure if you've ever developed an open source project, you, you get tired of complaints like this. Your usability is bad. I can't tell you why it's bad, but your product is hard to use and I don't like it. Now, you can do two things in this scenario. You can just double down and say RTFM and not try and actually improve your product, or you can use some sort of systematic way of improving the usability. And the other thing is that usable security is even harder than just trying to, to find something usable. Look how long we were listening to music with all sorts of weird technologies before we finally settled on the iPhone or the iPod. That was a very usable, easy way to have a ton of music at your disposal and it took many, many years. And there was this very, well, relatively old paper uh, called Why Johnny Can't Encrypt uh, that was put out by Alma Witten and J.D. Tiger uh, back in 1999. Uh, and basically it was the first time that, one of the first times that we said, hey, why don't we take this theory from HCI, Human Computer Interaction, which is an academic stream of research, and let's apply it to a security tool and see what pops out. And so Johnny can encrypt according to Witten and Tiger if he's made aware of the security tasks, able to figure out how to perform these tasks, doesn't make any dangerous errors, and feels sufficiently comfortable to continue using. And that last one is key. There's a, there's a phrase they use in hu the human computer interaction literature. It's called the gulf of execution. And a great example might be when you're trying to set uh, the timer on your VCR. And you, you know what your end goal is. You, you want, want to record the latest episode of Friends. And you know what your starting point is. You don't have a timer set. But you have no idea how to go from that start goal to the end goal. And if you can't logic your way towards it, you may just throw up your hands and say, you know what, I guess I'm just not going to see Friends this week. And Whitney and Tiger operationalized some properties about usable security that make it especially hard to do. And I'm going to give each of these its own little slide to really delve in. The first is the unmotivated user property, and uh, we had some projector issues. I wish this was bigger, but that is a tweet from Swift on security that says, tell me more about the crypto you invented with Taylor Swift leaning into the children. Uh, the unmotivated user property talks about the fact that security isn't a primary task, uh, that users aren't lazy. They're actually acting quite rationally. These are rational actors. Security is not something they want to do. Their time is of value, and it is limited. So they are going to expend the least energy possible on your security system. This is why they're writing their passwords down. This is why they're using dictionary words as passwords. This is why they're doing all the bad things. It's not because they hate you. <laughs> it's because they just have other things they want to do. They want to shop on Amazon. They want to send snarky tweets. Uh, and anything that gets in the way of that is an obstacle to be overcome. They're trying to hack your system. Second is the abstraction property. Programmers deal with abstraction all day. You, these concepts like public keys and signing and things like that, they're, they're very intuitive to people like me, um, but they're not for our users. So for example, when a user goes to a coffee shop, they might feel secure because the coffee shop has a password on their Wi-Fi. What they may not understand is that that is operating in pre-shared shared key mode, so therefore anyone else who has that password can just snarf, snarf up the packets and decrypt them. Third is the lack of feedback property. When my security is breached, I may not get any feedback that it's happened until my credentials are used or something bad happens. So for example, most people don't know they were on the wall of sheep until somebody logs into their system and messes with it. And finally, the barn door property. Uh, just like after the horse runs out of the barn, it's futile to lock the gate, secrets once leaked remain so forever. Small errors 
irreversible consequences. So for example, uh, with Dread Pirate Roberts, uh, the guy who ran the Silk Road, uh, he plugged the Silk Road at one point using his real Gmail address, which had his real name in there. Uh, the, the feds started monitoring his physical mail and he had some fake IDs shipped to him with a bunch of names other than his legal one. So they go and talk to him. <laughs> he says some suspicious stuff like, well, how do you know I ordered those? There's this site called the Silk Road that somebody could have sent them to me from as like a prank or something, which seems like a bit of an odd defense. Um, so they put physical surveillance on him and eventually they followed him to the San Francisco Public Library where he, when he logged into the uh, administration interface for the Silk Road, they just yanked the computer off of him and imaged it. <laughs> Finally, the weakest link property. The network is only as strong as the weakest link, that's the user. Uh, an attacker only needs to find one unpatched system and that unpatched system may be the person who uh, clicks on a phishing link. So how can you make your privacy software more usable? Uh, the first is the idea of what, what I heard about when I was interviewing at IBM Design called the T-shaped designer and the idea is to have a depth in one area and breadth in two. And the three areas they're talking about are uh, user research, uh, design in the more artistic sense, uh, and software engineering. And usually what you'll see happen is when we're hiring engineers, we, we hire purely on software engineering. Uh, we don't really care about these other two qualities. Um, and especially on open source projects, <laughs> Um, you know, you may be the solitary developer or only one or two developers on a project. So you may have somebody who's a crypto expert who's doing the crypto, you have a networking guy who's doing some networking modules and everything's just sort of going to fit together at the end. Um, and that's just, you know, usability is not just a module that you can have somebody off coding, coding in a corner and bring, bring to the table at the end. Uh, so let's say you decide that you want your project to be usable but you're experiencing this gulf of execution. You have the will to make your project usable, but you don't necessarily understand how you can do that. That's what the majority of this talk is going to be about. Um, and there's two different techniques you can really use that we're gonna talk about. The first is, no. Oh, wonderful. Uh, clicker decided not to work. Uh, there's two techniques you can use. The first is called a cognitive walkthrough. Really? Okay. The first is called a uh, cognitive walkthrough and you can do that just as a solitary researcher or you can do a full blown lab study. Uh, and I'm actually going to talk about both. Uh, I actually have a case study that we're going to share from some of my own research. So cognitive walkthrough is pretty simple. Uh, you're just going to sit down, you're going to think of some of the tasks that you would want to do when you're using this software and ask yourself, uh, are the users going to be able to produce the uh, effect this action has? Uh, are users going to see the control that they need to click on? Uh, once users find this control, are they going to realize that it produces the effect that they want? And after that action taken, will users understand the feedback they get? So basically you just come up with a set of tasks that you need to accomplish. You go through the, use, the interface thinking critically about how you could go what could go wrong or what would be confusing and you just sort of document the process along the way and you can usually find mo most of the high level usability issues just by doing this. Um, but it does have some problems because again, you are an expert, you're probably the person who designed the system and you're going to have some blind spots about what may be hard to use. So to give you an idea when we say core tasks, there was a paper by Jeremy Clark and a few others called Usability of Anonymous Web Browsing, which was the first examination of Tor usability. And this was the study that led to the creation of the Tor browser bundle, that they looked at all these different ways you could set up Tor, Privoxy, command line, et cetera, et cetera, and unsurprisingly came to the conclusion that the most usable way of setting up Tor was to have some sort of integrated browser that you just started up and Tor is encapsulated within it. Um, so their core tasks were just to install Tor, configure Tor, confirm that the traffic is being anonymized, which is always a good thing, uh, and then successfully disable Tor and return to a direct connection. Because back then, uh, everybody is really big on the Tor button extension. The idea was that we're going to be browsing in our normal browsing, we're going to click this Tor button extension, turn on Tor, do some stuff, and turn it off. We now know that that's kind of dangerous. <laughs> we now know that's not the best idea and it's better to have a separate browser um, but, but that was the state of the art at the time and that was actually considered really usable that you could just click something in the UI and not just be messing around on the terminal. So then 
if we can get like 80% of the way there without having to do a big user study, why do one? Because that, whenever you come into the rest of your developers and say, I came up with the usability issues, you're going to get like, well, yeah, it's just your opinion, man. You think we should make these changes? I think they should read the manual. We've got two opinions. 50-50. Which way should we go? Here's a hint. They're probably going to want to go the way that doesn't require any more coding. <laughs> and then, you know, you're an expert. If you understand the system, you're going to see things differently. So, for example, Charlie here has a box of hornets. <laughs> and he's saying, you know what? I'm going to pop a little H here on this box so everyone knows that it's full of hornets. <laughs> and <laughs> these are the si kinds of errors that you can make if you, as an expert, try and design an interface because you have this intimate knowledge of the system. So we're going to talk about a case study. This was actually a master's thesis I did when I was in grad school. Um, you know, I know, um, you know, I'm not a big fan of school either, um, but when it comes to uh, doing usability, it's actually really useful to have some background in experimental psychology, <laughs> anthropology, things like that. Um, you know, I th uh, I'm not sure if doing a PhD was the best move. Um, getting a master's and dropping out probably was, though. <laughs> so just to give a really quick overview, just in case not everybody in the room is familiar with Tor, uh, it's basically this anonymity service that uses onion routing technology. It was originally developed by the Navy. Uh, the Navy realized if you have an anonymity network that is only used by people in the Navy, maybe if I don't know which particular person in the Navy is using Tor, we know someone in the Navy is visiting my website and that might be problematic. So they decided to expand the pool. Uh, it got taken over by the EFF for a while and uh, funded that is. Uh, and is now its own 501c3 nonprofit. Um, and the basic idea is that you're routing your traffic through three nodes the entry node, middle node, and exit node uh, to max mask your identity. And you should note when using Tor that your content is, is not encrypted when it's exiting the network unless you're using HTTPS or something. So, you know, you're just going to get a list of Tor nodes from a directory server, you're going to go through your path. And then every 10 minutes, you're actually switching circuits, and each website gets its own circus, circuit. So if I'm using the Guardian in one tab and I'm looking at the Washington Post in the other, you don't necessarily know that I'm looking at both those websites. There had been some previous research on Tor usability, but they basically just did this cognitive walkthrough, uh, said put, a, put it in a bundle, and then did the whole mission accomplished and fly off in a helicopter. Typical of academic research. <laughs> Uh, so the original Tor browser bundle at the time we were doing this was a custom Firefox build. Uh, they also included Vidalia that was doing the proxy management and then it had the Tor button extension built in which w allows you uh, to turn the Tor browser bundle on and off. So just to sort of give a timeline about when all this went out, um, we, we did the first of the two studies back in 2012. We ended up at this little conference in Spain, which I did not know this until I, they showed up, but most of the tour developers went there as well. So when I was giving this original uh, research, I had like Roger Dingledine sitting in the front row. <laughs> um, so then we spoke with Tor, they actually ended up making some changes to the UI and then we developed a custom extension to do some of the changes that weren't being put in. Uh, and then we actually did a second second usability study where we just verified because um, at the time I was in grad school it wasn't good enough to just you know improve an open source project you had to make it like a full blown scientific experiment. <laughs> um, so you know and we did find out that the well I'll just get to that later. Um, so yeah, two studies, about the same number of students download and install the Tor browser bundle. Um, the, at, as, at the time of the second study, the Tor browser bundle had, had done several changes. Most importantly, they had dropped Vidalia, which as we'll see later, having Vidalia in the mix really just created a lot of weird issues, um, and rolled that functionality into the Tor browser bundle so that there was only one window for Tor at any given time. And the way we went about this was actually pretty simple. Um, we passed out consent forms and study sheets. Uh, this was an IRB approved study uh, and I'm not going to get into that in detail but basically you know, it's not considered ethical to just take uh, somebody's lab section and say congratulations I'm going to experiment on you. Um, we get it 
consent for the experimentation, and if they had not wanted to participate in the experiment, they had to be free to uh, do something else instead. So we let them like write an essay on how Tor works or something like that if they didn't feel comfortable doing this. Um, we briefed them that this wasn't a typical lab. So normally if we're doing a, a lab for this class, they have some sort of task they have to work through on their own. And it would actually be considered cheating to just you know, ask the person sitting next to them for the answer, ask the TA for the answer. Um, so we tell them that each time you encounter an issue, just raise your hand and I'm gonna come over and tell you how to fix it. And then when I did this, I would say, you know, please just write down the issue you had because we wanna catalog all the issues that the software is encountering. And then this is the really interesting part because how do you move from a list of complaints to uh, something that you can work with? Uh, and they have this thing in psychology they refer to as coding responses, but they're talking about coding them in the sense of coding them into categories. So what you do is you get two people to independently come up with a list of categories. You agree on you know, the intersection of those, uh, or the union of those becomes this final, final category list after you talk a bit and make sure you're not overlapping. Uh, and then both coders independently read through uh, each issue and decide to assign it to a category. And then you can actually generate uh, what's called a Cohen's Kappa, which is just basically a fancy way of making sure that the amount of agreement between the two coders was, was more than you would expect from random chance. Because you don't want a situation where you know, we're both just completely going wild. And so we came up with a bunch of issues. Uh, but it's really hard to read that graph. So I've also got a pie chart. And the big, huge, big takeaway that we found was that about 57% of the issues boil down to three distinct usability issues. You change these three things and hypothetically you can cut the usability issues in half. And we're going to go in detail into each of these. The first was the concept of long launch time. Where's that pointer? Oh, so you'll make a laser, but you won't go forward. Interesting. Uh, so on the old version of Tor, when you clicked to start Tor, this, uh, you would be told you're now connected to the Tor network. And at this point, users would go, yay, I'm on Tor. I can you know, be anonymous. The problem was that only the uh, Tor browser bundle window was anonymous. Nothing else was. So let's say I had previously had Chrome open, and I'm being told I'm connected to Tor. Okay, I'm gonna hop into Chrome, log into Facebook, and organize a protest and probably get shot because I was not anonymous when I did that. <laughs> um, so our so proposed solution was to alter, we actually didn't think high enough. We said you should just alter the lag so that you didn't have this situation where Vidalia was popping up and then there was a long delay until the window opened. Uh, and the Tor project actually just rolled all of this functionality into the Tor button extension. The second issue we encountered was browsing delay. And then this becomes a little bit harder because people are basically complaining Tor is slow. There have been entire DEF CON talks about the fact that Tor is slow and Roger Dinglenheim assures us he's working on it. And the thing about this is that you're just never going to be as fast routing your, ser your traffic through a series of nodes as you will if you were doing a straight shot. So then it becomes more of a communication issue. How can we make users aware of this trade-off? Uh, you know, there's been some research that uh, 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 users are more willing to do some sacrifices if they're explicitly using privacy enhancing technologies. And also it's just like in general, like, you know, if you're in a coffee shop, you might not be as angry you can't use Netflix than if you were at home. It's about setting expectations. So we came up with these warning dialogues that could pop up when Tor was experiencing a large amount of latency and say, due to security, uh, and there was, there was research that basically shows if you tell somebody we're doing this for security, they'll tolerate all sorts of stuff. Proof, in, proof of that, for example, lies within the TSA. <laughs> uh, so Tor knows you're experiencing delay. We apologize. Thank you for your patience. Hypothetically, if they're being shown this, they're, gonna, they're not going to be as angry. And then the third thing was the, when the users were window discriminability. So these users aren't sure which window was the Tor browser bundle. Um, well, at the time, it was a custom Firefox build in that they even ha still had the Firefox logo. So if you've got Firefox open and you've got the Tor browser bundle window open, you're not really sure which is which if you go off into another application. So they ended up developing this really nice logo, really sleek. I really like how it's not focused directly on the US, directly on the Asia, like trying to show the entire world. Eh, nice little artistic license there. 
So what happened after we made these usability, did this study? Um, and so between the two studies, the number of people who just said no problems, because I guess I should backtrack a little and say um, that we, you know, at one point one, one guy got to the, the end of the thing and he's like, I didn't have any issues. I'm like, are you sure? Because if you didn't have any issues, that's a valid data point. We don't want to discourage you. We just didn't want a situation where the entire class said, oh yeah, I didn't have any issues and then walked out after two minutes. Um, and we probably would have just discarded that result. But there was double the amount of people after, d after we made these changes who said, oh, I'm not actually experiencing any uh, usability issues. We also had an across the board reduction uh, in these usability issues. Um, so long launch time went way down, all the, but everything went down at least a little. Um, well, this went through a lot quicker than I thought. Um, so just to kind of s summarize, usability is this uniquely hard problem. You should try and hire these T-shaped designers who also have experience with UX research and re UX design. And that doesn't have, mean that they have to be experts. It just means that they have to have a passing familiarity. Um, cognitive walkthroughs can help suss out usability issues, even if your project has minimal resources. Um, and you should talk to your users. Uh, usability is not a one-time operation. You need to revisit this per periodically. And finally, you may be sitting here thinking about what you can do next. Um, and I would recommend that you read the paper Why Johnny Can't Encrypt. You read Users Are Not the Enemy by Angela Sasse, which we were talking about earlier. Uh, you read Why Johnny Can't Blow the Whistle, which is the paper that I was just discussing. Um, there's an entire human computer interaction bibliography that has a bunch of free papers. Um, and also just, you know, come up with a few things you want to read on your own. You know, the thing I really want to push in this talk that usability is not a checklist. This is not, you know, like I, I think any, any DEF CON attendee uh, who I pulled out of the hallway would probably, if I said, you know, are you sick of security being a checklist, they would, they would nod furiously that, you know, we don't want this to have like the equivalent of PC, the PCI standards for usability where we're just checking boxes. We've done this. We've done that. We did a cognitive walkthrough. We did, we actually want to have usability. Um, I'm just going to back up because I thought I, accidentally skipped something, but I guess I didn't. So I just moved through these a lot faster um, than I intended. Um, but that does mean we have some extra time for questions. Uh, if anybody has any. Uh, so go ahead. So the question is if I've heard of anything that would make uh, dot onion addresses a little uh, easier to read, a little less fishable, because if I can know this is the site I'm going to. Um, I haven't seen anything specifically related to dot onion addresses. I've seen some really interesting schemes. For example, Mozilla had a thing up, uh, uh, I think it was like about a month ago, where they were talking about this idea of using emojis as ciphers, that like you can use chunks of characters equals this emoji, one chunk of characters equals that. So that could be something that you could do. You could try and translate this this long string of characters into a series of uh, pictures, um, or you know it could be as simple as trying to display it in chunks. Like um, there's been some research that people usually can only remember five plus or minus two, uh, seven plus or minus two chunks of information. So if you can split the onion up, you know, just adding dashes. You know, if you can just visually separate that out a little bit so that people can check four at a time, uh, that can be helpful. Um, I mean, generally, like if I if I had the perfect idea is like you have like a general idea of what your software product is going to be, and um, you know you can write backend stuff uh, before beforehand. 
Um, but if you m would want to have like a gen at least a general idea going in of what the flow is going to be, and that doesn't necessarily mean the interface specifically. Like, but if I was going to write like the next Veracrypt, I would at least know know a basic flow of like somebody's going to you know create a container, put things in the container, open the container, uh, things like that. That you would want to try and come up with these flows early on, and then yes, you could try and develop a little bit in parallel. Because um, I can think of another a number of scenarios where you're going to be working out the kinks in something on the low level and then be able to be in parallel working on the high level UI. You might not be coding up the final UI, but you can at least be planning it out. Well, sort of as a follow up, it's like there's a trade off between what is, like if you build a security system or a protocol or whatever that's very secure, but it's completely inherently unusable, and like we don't have a, or we don't have a research solution to the usability challenges, it doesn't really help it. So like that's sort of like, angle I was coming at it is like, is, should I constrain the way I'm developing other parts of the protocol by usability research? Well, usually what you can try and do is you can, it's always possible to offer uh, uh, like a simple UI and then have something that you can click on to go into these sort of advanced options for the for the user who wants to because the problem is like what you present to the user will be clicked on <laughs> so if you bury some of the more complicated stuff in the UI the things that you know only the experts are going to need you know if somebody's truly an expert they might not even be doing these things in the UI to begin with they might be using the command line version anyways No, so these were two different semesters. So this was like, you know, the fall of, I forget when, but it was like, let's say fall of 2012, fall of 2013. It was two separate classes. Yeah, so Signal and Tor are both good. Um, trying to think. Um, you know, um, Veracrypt's do, doing better. Um, you know, not perfect, but <laughs> um, doing better than uh, TrueCrypt used to. Uh, Well, now you're starting to get into the harder things. Like one of the things the paper talked about was uh, that we didn't really go into in this talk because I thought I was going to be pressed for time was they, there was a lot of security warning confusion and you can do entire papers just on how to design one security dialogue. But that can be, you know, confusing for people. Um, you don't see this error as much, but when people would get mixed content errors, so you would have it where parts of the page were HTTPS encrypted and parts weren't. Um, and you would often get those when you were doing the Google captcha that the image for the CAPTCHA actually was going over plain HTTP and the rest of the page wasn't. Um, so there's a lot of times where you'll get these really advanced warnings that it's just, I don't know what's going on, I don't know what this warning means. Um, so there's a lot of room for improvement there. Um, but it's one of those things where, you know, they've gotten very, very good UX and, in, and the remaining problems are really hard ones. Sure. So that's an interesting point because then basically you've got this, uh, you know, the bake in. Or I forget what the technical term would be. Like, like something like, for example, when Microsoft Office moved moved to the ribbon, you can you can the ribbon is probably more intuitive for somebody who's never used Microsoft Office before, but for somebody who is used to a very specific set of actions to get very specific responses, having to relearn the UI. Um, I think that you know you basically have to decide you know that there is going to be this this sort of switching cost for lack of a better term of you know switching to a more usable UI and you can make sure you have some documentation available so that if somebody is having trouble finding their their tasks that they're not just left out in the cold maybe not just you know and really you know like I think uh, you know when Tor set out the browser bundle and when they dropped daily and things like that. They, they do like a, a blog with every release that details what's been changed. Um, and if you're doing major changes, you can try and have some help. <laughs> 